I'd like to preach to you a message entitled, The Promise of Chastening. The Promise of Chastening. Let's begin, please, with a word of prayer as we quiet our hearts to hear what God has for us from his word. Father in heaven, we ask you this one more time. We prayed to you several times already. We, we do not ever want to make a vanity of prayer, of talking with you. It's, it's a real privilege, Lord, to be able to talk to you. And we ask you, Father, to set the word of God on fire and our hearts on fire. That we may ever decrease and may you ever increase. We beg you, O God, that we would not go through formality. As we go through the living word of God, real verses that you said from your heart. And I just pray that this would be such a precious time. In Jesus' precious name, amen. There is nothing so joyful as a believer walking transparently and full of faith in the Lord. There is nothing so joyful as that, and there is nothing so miserable as a believer walking in sin under his Father's chastening hand. I want to say that one more time because it, it kind of fills out the message. There is nothing so joyful as a believer walking transparently and full of faith in the Lord. And there is nothing so miserable as a believer walking in sin under his father's chastening hand. We've been preaching through the book of Joshua. We are almost time to have a celebration because we're coming to the very last chapter. We are on chapter 23, about to hit chapter 24. The great leader Joshua knew that he was dying. And as he knew he was dying... He knew that the children of Israel needed a word, a closing, excuse me, word from the great leader. He wanted to tell them that they could have abundant and joyful life as the chosen of God if they would keep God's law by separating from unbelievers that remained in the promised land. Now, some of you are new. We preach the whole way through this, and most of us, we've heard all of how they conquered in the promised land and how the, the land was divided, and we've come to this point where Joshua is saying goodbye. We preached last week the courageous biblical separation that is required, that is called on both in the Old and the New Testament from Joshua's parting words. We saw that separating from sin and false teachers and disobedient brothers and close ties with unbelievers in the New Testament is an act of cleaving and loving God. It is not a harsh things of those crazy Christians. It is an act of cleaving and loving God. But Joshua told them something else. He told them this, and it's very serious. He told them if they turned from obeying or stopped or neglected obeying God's word to separate from the sinful culture of unbelievers around them, the remnant left in the promised land, they should expect the chastening of God upon them. If they left the word of God from obeying the word of God, what they should expect and account on is God's chastening. Turn back to the passage, Joshua 23, that Pastor Cruz read. Joshua 23, we're going to hear from the Word of God. Joshua 23, stand please, and let's read it one more time very closely this morning, tethering our thoughts to the text. Joshua 23, beginning in verse number 11, take good heed therefore unto yourselves. You know, the whole thing that I preached before came up to verse number 10, about to separate from immorality, unbelievers, idolaters, these kind of things. Verse number 11, take good heed therefore unto yourselves that you love the Lord your God. Else if you do in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and they unto you, know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. Now he's dying. And ye know in, your, in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you and not one thing hath failed thereof. Therefore, it, it shall come to pass 
that as all good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so shall the Lord bring upon you all evil things, until ye have destroyed, he have destroyed you from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. When ye have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods and bowed yourself uh, to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and ye shall perish quickly from off the good land which he hath given unto you. You may be seated. The proper application of these verses to you, people of Lighthouse Baptist Church, on this beautiful, almost fall kind of morning, and to 21st century people of all places are two different views. To apply this this morning, you need to think first in the first way, and then the second way, or first in the first point, that perspective, and then in the second perspective. Perspective number one, rejecting God's law equals damnation to your life. That's probably the serious, most serious thing I could ever say from this pulpit here this morning, is what Joshua is saying. Rejecting God's law equals damnation to your life. Consider the big picture here. What Joshua is telling them about transgressing the covenant, look at verse number 16 where he makes that statement, transgressing the covenant. He's talking about something very specific. It's breaking the law or the covenant of Moses. It's called the Mosaic covenant, the, the word of the law of Moses in verse number six that we preached on before that brings, that holds only one penalty, and it's the penalty of death. Both physical death, dying on this world, and then dying spiritually and being separated from God in the next world in a place called the lake of fire. This is nothing new to them. As they heard Joshua say this, this big warning, it's not like, what, what do you mean? If we do this, this is going to happen. They knew Moses' covenant. They knew how it went. Keep all the law or perish. I mean, that's, you know, that's just pretty rough stuff. Keep all the law or perish. Listen, as it is originally given in Deuteronomy chapter 30, listen how amazingly straightforward and how harsh, and you might want to say, or how clear this is to these people. See, I have set before you, this is Deuteronomy 30, 15. I just want to quote it as the Mosaic law was first given. See, I have set before you this day life and good and death and evil. In that I command you this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and judgments that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thy heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt draw away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land. Uh, whither thou passest over Jordan to go possess it. I call heaven and earth to rec- record this day against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. That's what the Mosaic covenant sounded like. Keep the law or perish. What Joshua is promising them is repeated, look in your Bible at, at our text in verse 13, the word perish, in verse 14, the word destroyed, in verse 16, the promise of perishing is that the penalty for breaking God's law is the judgment of death. It wasn't only that they would lose the land. When I first studied this and I first read this, I, th- I really thought what God was saying was that, you know, if you, if you intermingle among the sinful people and the other gods or whatever, you're going to lose the land. And I knew that God was, in the future, going to give it back to Israel. He's still going to give it back to Israel. All the promises to Israel are true and will come to pass. Stand with Israel. You'll be good. I say that all the time. Just want to remind you. But that's not what it's saying. It's not just that they were going to lose the land. They were going to lose their souls. He is saying, you reject my laws. You're going to perish. You're going to lose your souls You lose your lives first and then your souls. Damnation is the word. Folks, listen. This harsh penalty of disobeying God's commandments and command is still the case. And the reason why Israel and why each person in this room desperately needs Jesus Christ. It is still the case that you break God's law and you perish. Realistically, it is not possible to keep God's law. Because we were born by nature as sinners. What God is giving them, I want to be very clear about this. God has bigger wisdom than we have. What God is giving them is an impossible task. 
What Joshua is telling them even is an impossible tax, uh, excuse me, an impossible task by the nature of the command. We can't do it. The harshness of the law cries out as it gives the command. It's impossible. It's impossible to perfectly and consistently follow all of God's laws. These Jews would fail God. The ones right here, they're going to blow it. They're, they did blow it. They, they, even, they lost the lands, and many of them lost their souls. And that's sad. I told you what was in the future here after this. They could not keep the law by their willpower or their strength. And neither can we. They needed a substitute who would keep the law for them. Someone who was strong enough and perfect enough to keep the law for them. Someone who would forgive all their violations against the law and cast those violations out of the way. Someone who would actually come inside of them to indwell them, to make them righteous from their hearts on the inside and help them and give them strength to be righteous from their heart. They needed a substitute. They could not carry out what Joshua was telling them. God gave them laws that they could not keep and penalties that they could not avoid to point them to salvation that they could not create on their own. Isn't that good? That's pretty good. God gave them laws that they could not keep and penalties that they could not avoid to appoint them to salvation that they could not create on their own or earn. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Which of us any time in our lives have not put things in priority at times above God. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, not just his name, but how many of us here have not treated God in an empty way. Honor thy father and thy mother. Teenagers, have you done that perfectly in your life? Perhaps we should ask your folks. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Which one of us have not exaggerated or Flat out lied to defend ourselves. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You say, I haven't done that one. He that looketh on a woman and lusteth after in his heart hath committed adultery already, Jesus says. Thou shalt not covet. Which of us here have not coveted? And on and on. Who can keep what Joshua is saying? Who can keep verse 6? The laws of Moses we cannot Israel could not keep these commands perfectly and consistently, and neither can we. What Joshua is telling Israel here about keeping God's word in a a wicked culture is easy to say and impossible to do as a natural man. There has to be, folks, another way. There has got, because we can't do this, and neither could they. There's got to be another way or we will all certainly perish there is another way, and it sounds like this. Galatians 3.22, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. I mean, that just sounds like he's talking about this text that we're reading today. Before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, our schoolteacher, our tutor to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. By faith. That is the other way. Faith in Jesus Christ. Now, there it is. That's surely better news than what... Joshua was telling his people, Joshua was saying, if you don't keep all this, listen, you're going to perish. God's going to wipe you out. The law brings us to frustration of the impossibility to obey, but also brings us like a school teacher to the answer. It is not in our perfection, that is never the answer, but a faith in the perfection and punishment of another, Jesus Christ, our substitute, of course. That is the other way. And God, you know, folks, I want to just pause here a second. What incredible wisdom of God to bring people to the frustration of I can't do it so that they'll repent and look for grace. So that they'll look for something outside of themselves. And that's the deal. You can't save yourself. You cannot try to keep the law yourself. It doesn't happen. You must have grace. Some of you are great givers and you're terrible takers in salvation. You must be a taker because you're certainly not a giver. Grace. 
Now, I said all that to show you this first perspective here as Joshua is standing and giving this speech as he goes the way of the world. And uh, it's the first perspective of what Joshua is saying. He is saying that if you turn away from Moses' law, you're, you're going to perish for sure. And I tell you the same thing this morning, and I go one step further, that you all and I all or me all, I didn't check my West Virginia vocabulary, me and and you and have already been condemned as sinners. We've already blown it before you came to this sermon. I can't, I can't preach to you to keep this sermon. You've already blown it. And I've already blown it. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. We are already condemned as sinners. The law has concluded us all as lawbreakers. So our only hope is in that substitute. Jesus was punished for us. Our only hope is the fact that he was punished for us instead of us. Our only hope is that Jesus lived perfectly for us instead of us. And these two wonderful facts, that he lived a perfect life in our place and that he was the perfect sacrifice in our place and took all of our punishment and all of our death upon himself must be yours to escape this passage. It must be yours. God is just. He's the just judge. He must damn by the law. But he is a loving God also, and he gave grace by Jesus. And I would just ask you, do you have Jesus Christ as your answer this morning? Do you have the other way, or are you still trying to plow it out to impress God? My friend, nobody impresses God. He's perfect. You know, you're, you're going to waste a lot of time doing that. You are going to really spin your wheels, and it's only going to end up in your own damnation. You need something outside of yourself. You need Jesus Christ. And you can receive him right now by simple faith, just simple believing what I've told you in his cross, his substitutionary cross that he died in your place for your penalty. By his resurrection, he came, and he, can, he came up from the grave and gave you a new life. And putting your faith and trust in him right now by simple faith of calling out and ask, asking him to save you right now. You can do that right now in your heart, right where you're sitting. Right now. Lord Jesus, save me. I need, I need something outside of myself. Save me. Call that out from the heart. It's a one-time decision uh, where, you, where you believe what God has provided by grace and you accept Jesus Christ and you're never the same. He will regenerate you, make you born again right now, right now, right now. You don't have to perish. There's most definitely then another perspective in the text. Okay, that's the first perspective. I mean, that's the straight off first generation, what he was saying to them. But there is definitely a second application of this part of Joshua's speech, and it is to God's people who have already put their trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And here is what it sounds like. Number two, living in willful sin will bring your father's chastisement. Living in willful sin will assuredly bring your father's chastisement. Think through this passage again, okay? Change gears, all right? Reset. Second perspective of this passage. Second application. Here it is. He speaks of loving and cleaving to God. Look at the Bible in verse number 8. You see there, but cleave to the Lord your God in verse number 11. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves that ye love the Lord your God. He speaks of a different perspective here, and that is a personal perspective of possession of God. He opened the chapter assuring them that God was their God, but that he is, and he's ending the, the passage by saying, if you turn away from God's word, you're going to be chastened sure of it, sorely of it. All right? He is coming from the perspective then of people who have God, like you. Most of you are on Christ the solid rock. If you are, say, amen. amen. So read verse 13 from that perspective. Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. Like a very determined, loving father, daddy, God has chastened his people, Israel, through the years. If you look at the history of, of Israel in, in your history books and clear back into biblical times, God has been faithful in chastening Israel. 
because he is their father and because he is a good and loving father and he's bringing them to a place that we will see in the end of time. They are still being chastened. And folks, that is true also of New Testament, non-Jewish, Gentile, us, us, people who've accepted Christ, who've been grafted in, born-again believers. It is true also of us that we have the same Heavenly Father who promises surely, like a loving, determined dad, to chasten us when we run from him like Jonah or like the prodigal son or tolerating sin in your life, secret sin, giving yourself permission to do what God's word says don't do, disgracing the grace that saved you and missing the joyful walk with God that you could have as a Christian. God has promised, I'm going to bring you back. I am going to continue to deal with you and chasten you to bring you back. I'm a loving father. Notice the chastisement God promises, child of God, when you live in disobedience. What Joshua says mirrors New Testament chastening of God's children, of you. First of all, there is immediate chastisement. Did you hear verse 13? You know, you know I don't want thorns in my eyes. No, th- I've had them in my fingers. Owie. Have you, do you see the, the miserableness, read it again, that when these people would disobey the law and that they would go and mingle with unbelievers and they would, they would become part of the unbelieving culture and their society, look what God says. Know for certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides, that's a whip, scourging your side and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. That's miserable stuff. Immediate things that would happen, immediate chastening that would happen if they wouldn't obey God. But listen, folks, that, what you're seeing there, I mean, such graphic language, is no more miserable than a Christian who decides to live in willful sin. A Christian that is allowing sin in his life immediately undergoes misery, though he may push through it. Though may, he may be bullheaded to heck to keep hold of it. You say, what misery, what immediate minis- or, excuse me, misery. Ministry is not misery. That's a slip of the tongue. What misery? Well, how about the misery of worthless prayer? Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard, if I cherish iniquity in my heart as a believer, the Lord will not hear me. He will not hear me. A believer who's allowing willful sin to continue in their life and tolerating that sin in their life has a worthless prayer life. The Lord will not hear them. Just like the fellowship of a daddy, an earthly daddy and son are broken when when there's disobedience, so the prayer life of a believer is broken when he lives in disobedience to his heavenly father. And you need to understand that clearly, believer. And some of you that tolerate sin in your life, that are disobeying God, you're going to keep on going and you, you pray every day. And it's worthless. And it's just bouncing around the room because the Lord has told you, make, make things right with me. Turn away from the sin. I'm your daddy. I want to be right with you. There is other miseries immediate. The, the misery of lost joy. A Christian who's regenerated, has the Holy Spirit inside of them, can never be joyful in sin. You'd be happy for three minutes or 30 minutes or whatever. You can have no lasting joy. When backslidden David cries out in Psalm 51, the the passage that I read at the beginning of the service, he says in verse 12, when he's getting right with God, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. A believer in sin like David has no joy in his inner man. David did all that stuff to try to make himself happy. Lusted after Bathsheba, brought him to himself, you know, committed uh, adultery with her, killed her husband to cover it up, all of that, all of that, all of that. No joy, no joy. There's also the misery of impotent, powerless living to a Christian who is allowing himself to live in sin. God can't use you spiritually to your full potential. 
This is played out in the next verse in the passage, Psalm 51, with David when he's making things right with God, and he says this. He says in verse 13, Then, when I make things right with you, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. What was his point? What's the, the Holy Spirit's point in writing that verse? When he was getting right with God, it was that he was put on the shelf. There was no power. You know, the Scripture says in the New Testament that, that uh, if you will separate from sinfulness and sinful people, then you will be a vessel of honor, meet or appropriate for the master's use. God loves to use clean vessels. Now sometimes he will be forced, or sometimes in his great will, he will use dirty vessels, but it's not appropriate. It's not his first choice, what he goes for. Listen, if you in intentionally, believer, remain in willful sin, you're pushing away the power of the Lord to be able to help people, to be able to be a blessing, to be able to, to give the gospel to others and it really matter. You are, you, are, you are wasting your life of what God wants to do in your life, in ministries and in children's ministries or, or, or when you go to Churchman's Village or what is, whatever you do. You need power. And that power is quenched when you choose to live in sin. The loss of joy thing goes right into another immediate misery. It's the misery of a vexed spirit to a Christian who is tolerating sin. Living in sin vexes the spirit of a Christian who's been made new by Jesus Christ. You say, where do you get that vexing? You know, that sounds so vexing. Where do you get that? Straight out of the word of God, listen to that in Lot's life when he would not remove himself from Sodom's sin. You remember, he just like encamped, he set his, pitched his tent towards it, and God looked towards Sodom, and then he was in the gate, and he just hung around, just involved himself around sin and sinful culture. Listen to what the Bible says about that. 2 Peter 2.8 says, For that righteous man, Lot, that is, he's a, he was a believer, he was a righteous man, dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Daily that righteous man stayed engaged, entrenched in sinfulness all around him and would not pull out and would not separate and daily his soul was vexed. Christian, you are the same. The word vexed means in pain and torment. You know, when you've been made new by the Lord, you have no home there anymore. You've got no, you know, it, it, you, you can try to make yourself like that, sinful and live in sinful and just continue with sinful folks. You're not there anymore. You're a new creature. Old things are passed away. You'll never fit. You're a Round peg in a square hole, you're not going to fit anymore. You'll be vexed. Listen, folks, as much as you may enjoy that sinfulness temporarily, it is bringing immediate misery to you because Christ has changed you. It's like thorns in your eyes and scourges on your side. Living in sin will never satisfy you. You'll never be happy here on this earth as a child of God living and tolerating whatever sin or petty sin you're allowing. But there's something else about your father's chastisement that you must know. It isn't just the immediate misery of verse number 13 that's going to come, or that comes when you tolerate sin. Your father loves you so much that he is going to engage in the systematic discipline of correcting you back to him. So it's not just the immediate stuff that I can't be satisfied and that I'm, you know, my joy is taken away, whatever. God, your loving, wonderful father, just like Toby Whitmer who loves his five children, involves himself in systematic discipline of those young people consistently, so your heavenly father loves you enough to chasten you back to himself systematically with pain to bring you back to repentance. He's not going to let you alone. Notice, Long-term chastisement here. Verse 13 talks, there's a time factor in verse 13 that talks about until, you'll notice, you know, clear down there, until you perish. Verse 16, there's a time factor. Yeah, this is going to happen. You're going to turn away. God's going to bring whatever. Then shall the anger of the Lord. There, it's not a perfect comparison here to the New Testament, but there is the fact that there's immediate things that go on in chastisement. When a child of God lives in sin, and there is long-term, very systematic things that the Lord is choosing to do. 
that he will consistently do over time. These are extremely strong threats and promises being made to a group of people that God, Israel, intended eventually to gather in the promised land to rule as their king one day and save them nationally, bring them all to faith in Jesus Christ. And the comparison, as I said, is not perfect, but there are equally fearful and strong time promises made to New Testament believers who are living and allowing willful sin in their life, and it sounds like this in the New Testament. Listen to the this. Hebrews 10.30, for we know him that hath said, vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again, the Lord shall judge his people. The next verse, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I would love to tell you that this passage is talking about the unsaved at the great white throne judgment, but it is not. The context of that Hebrews passage was not written to unbelievers, but in the context of a New Testament believer who was, who was disgracing the grace that saved him by living in willful sin. Listen to me. Hear me. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God is written to Christians, believers in Hebrews. The Lord shall judge his people. That's not the unsaved. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, is not talking about some enemy of God. It's talking about the friends and the daughters and the sons of God in that passage. That's strong. Many believers are living without any fear of the chastening promises of their father God. You allow the same kind of sins on a daily basis without repentance and without any fear you think there is no retribution. You think that, oh, well, I'm under grace. It gives me the liberty of sin. Listen, grace never compels somebody to sin. Grace always cries to the liberty of righteousness. It always pushes you towards purity and holiness. Grace always will. And there is a great apathy among God's people. I'm not just talking about this, this church. I'm talking about greater Christianity as well. And I'm talking to this church where we, do have, we have no fear of disobeying God in our Christian lives. We have no fear of just allowing things that we, we, can we can turn ourselves to passages in the New Testament and show you where it's wrong, yet we tolerate in our families. We tolerate in our personal lives and in our secret lives. It is mirrored here in the, the speech of Joshua. We love to think about God's mercy and grace and we like to smile about his goodness and his provision. We love to count on these things. The brothers and sisters, we need to count on something else. We need to count on God's chastening. This exact thought of what I just said is 14 and 15 in your text. About counting on the good things and excusing the fact that chastening will come. Look at how Joshua says it, verse 14. And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and ye know, here it is, in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God has concerned you, concerning you. And all of them said, yep, that's right. All those good things he said came to pass. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. Therefore it shall come to pass that as all good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so shall the Lord bring upon you all evil things. Now look here. You love to be a Christian who is under grace. And you love all the promises of God. And you've seen the Lord change your life by salvation. You've seen if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You've experienced that, and you say it's good. You've, you've seen God's provision in your life and in your family when you needed. The Lord took care of you uh, one way or the other. You have seen his comfort through times of hardship and crisis and tragedies and medical conditions. You have known the help of the Lord. You have experienced in this church the sweetness of believers that he promised. And just like he promised all those great things you need to, and you've taken great assurance in them, and we even sang about them this morning, so you need to believe with fervency that he chastens you when you won't judge yourself and remove yourself from the sin. As you count on God's many promises, add one promise to it, he will chasten you when you stay in sin. That's the thinking of 14 and 15 in your Bible. 
In the New Testament, God's chastening for his children is mentioned in at least nine specific passages of the New Testament. The same word for chasten is translated in our English Bible in those nine places as learned, same exact word that God spoke by inspiration, learned, teaching, nurture, instruction, and chasten. Chastening is always viewed in the realm of child rearing. It's always viewed that way as presented in Scripture, the training and the education of a child. And in the nine New Testament passages, it seems to have two sides to it. And one of them is the consistent daily side of instructing and educating your child. But the other side to the same word is the corrective side of discipline. That is not punitive for the sake of pain, but rather painful for the sake of change in the child's life. Let me say that again. It's not, it's not punitive for the sake of pain. It's not with the idea that God is, you're doing something and boom, God wants to bring you pain. But it is painful for the sake of you changing and you uh, being restored to fellowship with God and restored to walking in, in righteousness. Loving fathers chasten their children. And one thing is certain throughout the New Testament, very consistently about believers in chastening, it always happens. It is continuing to happen in your life. God is always doing it in our lives. He is always bring, bringing painful correction. He's always bringing the first side of it, of instructing and education, and he's always bringing painful correction when we will not separate ourselves from sin on our own. You know why? Because loving daddies chasten their children. This has nothing to do with the sermon. There are probably people in our congregation with the thought process, I love my children so much that I did not spank them. That's contrary to the word of God. If you love your children, you will discipline them. Repentant David in Psalm 51, again, the one that I, the, the, the chapter I read at the beginning, he describes the pain of chastening this way when he was out of fellowship with God. He said that the bones that you have broken may rejoice again. He knew God had broken bones in his life, probably figuratively, maybe physically, but he was getting right with God and he knew that those bones were going to be healed because he was getting right with the Lord. I will be preaching tonight, Lord willing, the premier New Testament passage on chastening. But let's look at a passage that we go to once a month around here when we take the Lord's table and let's see God's serious promise about chastening his children. Turn to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. A parallel passage to what Joshua is saying back in Joshua 23. It's New Testament chastening. 1 Corinthians 11. You'll recognize the first part because, again, I use this every Lord's Supper time, and I read this, but we're going to keep reading. 1 Corinthians 11. Verse 23 says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Verse 24, 1 Corinthians 11. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as I drink it, or as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show or proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever, verse 27, shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily or in an unworthy manner or fashion shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now this is talking about a believer. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. That is a serious passage, and frankly, verse number 30 
For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep should make every Christian in the room shudder. Listen, folks, God is real. And God's word is real. And we're not playing a game here. You know, let your faith rise to believe the word of God about this thing, about chastening of God's children. It was the first, this passage was the present report, verse 30, was a present report of why people in their congregation in Corinth were, were weak. The word means feeble in, in any way, in various ways whether it be emotionally or whether it be through their career situations or whatever it be, weak in some way, why they were sick and why they had died prematurely. It wasn't rampant meningitis or whatever the immediate uh, symptom or the immediate result or what they said. It was that the Lord was working. The reason was that they had gone a period of time living in an unworthy lifestyle. This is a, a disgraceful Sinful, disgracing lifestyle found in verse number 21 and 22. And they had taken the Lord's table, eating and drinking in a way of, of sinfulness. And they had brought to themselves, according to the scripture there, damnation, verse number 25. Really the word uh, is, should be translated judgment. It's not talking about hell damnation. That's obvious because it's talking to Christians. It's talking about they had eaten to themselves judgment upon them. And so the Lord chastened them. Listen to me, this fear of this passage and knowledge of this passage is why some of you don't take the Lord's Supper on a monthly basis. And you're half right. But the teaching here is not just a superstitious fear for the elements that we put, the bread and the juice that we put on the table to keep you from being chastised, the idea of just avoiding those elements and so you avoid the chastening. It is the fact that these group of people had gone for a period of time tolerating sinfulness in their life. The Lord's Supper was just highlighting that the sinfulness in these believers' life does not look like the perfect blood and bread of the Lord Jesus Christ and body. It didn't look like it. It was an affront to it. It was a disgrace to that. You're not living like your salvation. It wasn't the elements that were judging the people. It was the fact that they were continuing a period of time without being right with the Lord, of allowing sin in their life, knowledge. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. You are no longer a natural man. You are a new creation, and you have new power to live righteously. You can yield your members as instruments of righteousness, Romans says. Listen, folks, you can skip the Lord's Supper all you want to, and God still promises that chastening will come to his children that he loves. And look how strong the chastening here in the passage. It is extreme chastening in verse number 30. Weakness, feebleness, and sickness, and death. Is that real or just an idle threat? Or is the Lord writing this passage? Is Paul just making an idle th threat? No, this was a letter. He was telling them this was happening in their assembly, and he was probably most of them just identified it as, you know, viruses and things that were going on or whatever. He's saying, he's saying, please be understand that some of the reason for the weaknesses in your congregation, the, the people, the children of God there, some of the re reasons for the sickness, some of the reasons for the death are people are living in continual sin before their heavenly father. The verse is identifying the cause because likely they did not suspect that reason. There are many reasons for pain and sickness and feebleness and death in people's lives. Please understand this is no witch hunt. But we need to understand that living in continual sin is one of those reasons. It is real. Verse 30 is real. And God is still doing it in Christians' lives and still doing it in the church. It is not for us to winch, witch hunt God's chastening or present verdicts or, or brother so-and-so, it's obvious there must be sin in his life. No, that's wrong. You look at yourself. Don't ever let that be heard around here, that kind of stuff. But it is for you to know, individual believer, about yourself that it certainly happens and it still happens consistently because God is a consistent disciplinarian. He, is a, he continues to love you and wants to bring you back into perfect, transparent walk with him. You say, Pastor, you're trying to scare us. Absolutely. Because I know that this verse is true, and it's true for us today. 
Just like then, it is the reason that many painful things of all types happens to believers, even death. God uses a multitude of painful ways to chasten his children. He doesn't hold himself to a certain way to bring the chastening. He even says in the word of God that the goodness of God leadeth thee to, to repentance. He may chasten you by bringing a bunch of good things in your life until it breaks you in understanding how good your God is and you return to him. He can do whatever he wants to, but please understand, God's chastening is complex and it is sure. And it is happening in you. Notice an amazing truth in verse number 31. It was the joy of my life a few years ago when I really understood what it said in verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Or we would not be judged. There are believers here in this room who you walk close with the Lord and I say praise the Lord for you. You wonder why you can't identify God's painful chastening in your life. And the reason is that you are a self-judger. And praise the Lord for it. This is a good way to self-judge yourself. God does not have to judge you if you will judge yourself, this verse says. You fear God. You immediately seek restitution with God when you fall into sin. You immediately amputate sinful temptations. You do not allow sin to continue in your life on a daily basis. You quickly return to fellowship with the Lord when you have failed him. You are truly repentant, and he doesn't need to chasten you. It's verse number 31. You are self-judging, and that's a good thing. But there are believers here who are not repentant, who have a passe view of allowing sin in your life. And maybe you compare yourself to some other Christian who is doing the same things. That is a very poor comparison. Compare yourself to the scripture. You're complacent in your sin. You return to the same continuing sin day by day, though you know it is wrong. You tolerate the same vexing. You walk without joy. You let the things come into your eye gates and your ear gates, and you're touching the disgraces. Grace, verse 30 and verse 32, are for you. Verse 32 says... But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Your father promises to judge and to chasten you right now because he saved you and he made you his child. You are not of the world anymore. He will not deal with you at the great white throne judgment. Praise the Lord. So he deals with you right now and judges you. He brings you back into a right relationship with him right now. He lets the the world go on in their continual sinful way. He's not going to judge them until he's, they stand before him and he casts them in the lake of fire. He doesn't judge them. He doesn't chasten them. They are bastards. They, he is not their father. But because you are his child and he is your Abba Father, so he promised, I'm going to chasten you. If you don't self-judge, trust me, I'm walking, I'm walking to my rod of correction. There's a time element here in God's perfect wisdom. Joshua, sometimes, I want to just tell you, sometimes I just wish that when I would do wrong and when I would do sin, that God's chastening would immediately happen. That would be real good if I could get a hammer. I, wouldn't you like that? I mean, to me, that seems like that that would be a lot better. That doesn't grow us and sanctify us the way God wants us to. He wants us to mature to the place of self-judging. He wants us to mature beyond that to the place of living righteously. But please understand, his ways are the best. But because his rod of correct, correction is patient and slow towards you, don't you think it's not coming? Joshua promised Israel God's chastening, and the New Testament promises you that you, if, you're a, if you're a child of God, your heavenly Father will chasten you, and it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And that verse is for Christians. What are you going to do about what you heard this morning? You know secretly if you're allowing sin in your life or if you're separating. You know all the th hidden things of your life and the secret places of your life. Will you self-judge right now and repent and amputate living in sin right now? Will you self-judge? Will you radically amputate willing, continual sin? Or will you wait for the rod of correction?